All right, welcome, ladies and gentlemen. And take some uh, prayer requests or praises. Praises first. Jeff Surrett, material from Bible and Dave Ramsey. That's all you need. This is Bible and Dave Ramsey. It's good. Uh, any praises tonight? Yes, Mr. Halloran. She got out of the hospital, and then three days later, she developed a brain bleed and was back in the hospital. But now she's back home. So wow. That's a praise. And and my friend is 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 just recently come to the Lord, got saved, that's good. and and uh, his wife is starting to warm up to the. Idea. She doesn't uh, walk when he reads scripture to her or, or tells her some things about what he's read in the Word and stuff. And so um, uh, her name is Sharon and his name is Ambrose. And if you would pray for them, please. I guess God can use a, some time in the hospital to wake you up. Oh, 
Frankie, what's up, man? They're doing what? What is it? They're trying to get money off of Dante. Okay. We have a praise that Frankie and Francis now have a washer and dryer. So. Oh, yeah. We're supposed to go hook it up after church. Dryer. Okay. So hopefully it'll work. Any more praises? Requests? Yes? Um, there's these people and they're really close to our family. Um, and they have a little girl that is Bryn's age. And she had been sick a few times and they didn't think nothing of it. Well, her eyes started drooping and then um, they did a CT scan and she has a tumor on, in her brain. And so they, they found that out yesterday, flew them straight to the Mayo Clinic, and they did a um, spinal tap. Like, they found out it's not in her spine, but now they're waiting to see if it's in the spinal fluid, which I guess would be way worse, and um, I don't know what they can do at that point. But she's there now, so. And she's in good spirits and smiling and laughing and joking and just naive, which may be the best thing, but her parents aren't. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's really hard on all of them. You said it's a tumor. Yeah. And that's just friends? Yeah. What about their whole spiritual condition? Do you know of any? Um, I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I mean, Well, I want her to pray for that. Yes, Here's my friend Joshua, please, and I ask for him. And uh, I have an opportunity to play golf with a co-worker, but I don't know anything about him salvation-wise, but he's gonna, I'll find out more since Friday morning. Nice guy. It might help if you controlled your language while you're on the course, like you don't do with I'm me. So, I mean, I'm really yeah, stuff, yeah. You know? <laughs> that'd be good testimony. Now, what do we know? What, are we able to know what's what about Joshua? What are we? My praying? friend Joshua, he, he's a former student of mine. He's yes. He's okay. got mentally. I, I don't know how they say it today. Mental health, and he knows it, but it just keeps. It's just hard, man. And I just listen to him. I'm the, I'm the one who listens. And I preach to him about, he's saved. And he knows a lot about scripture and stuff. But just pray for him that he, God will allow his brain to work correctly in social areas and stuff. Anything else? Per request. Yeah, I just want to. Again, kind of pray for my mom. I know we did last week, but she um, she did end up having her second hip surgery on on Monday. Um, so she's uh, so the second one she had in, in about a month. And so they're yeah they're going through a hard time because the first one didn't go as as planned, and so they're kind of having a hard time with it and talking to the doctors and stuff. But unfortunately, they got to the point where she won't have to go to rehab. She can go home. They've got some home health care people coming in to rehab her at home. So thank goodness for that. But yeah, she's, uh, I know she's going through a tough time right now. And that's because the first one wasn't right and they had yeah, that. The first, yeah. yeah. Yes. Pray for a school starting next week. We're starting and I know public schools are starting and And if you would pray for us, we are still on track to leave on 
Friday, Lord willing, nothing's broken that wasn't not broken and nothing, yeah, so I think we're okay. If you don't want us to go, you can pray all sorts of curses upon trucks and trailers and stuff like that, but if we find out about that, <laughs> you're, you're in trouble. Anything else? Yes. So we her spiritual condition. I don't know anything about her. I, know. I just met her when I picked her up. <laughs> I like it. It's good. She's nine. Yeah, she was kind of timid when she got here. She doesn't know anybody, and so she wasn't quite sure to play the game. So when we came in, she was sitting in a chair watching. So hopefully, you know, she'll kind of join in. She'll get out there and do it, and then she'll be ready to come back next week. Yep. So eventually, we'll, we will need a bigger car. <laughs> Let's pray for a bus for you guys. Anything else? All right, if that's it, we'll go ahead and pray. Father, thank you for your unchanging character tonight. Thank you uh, for your steadfast love. Thank you for your long suffering and your gentleness and goodness to us, your children. Thank you for keeping us in your care. Thank you uh, that. Thank you for the Holy Spirit. Uh, thank you for the cross. Thank you for the blood that was shed uh, for us. Thank you that uh, nothing can separate us uh, from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And uh, thank you that we are in Christ and Christ is in us. And thank you that you call us your friends. Uh, Lord, and thank you that you call us your children, that tonight we can even come uh, before you as your children and give you uh, these burdens, these requests. Thank you for uh, how you've worked in the past. Thank you for your faithfulness to provide every need uh, that we have ever had. Uh, Lord, I pray for Jeff tonight as he speaks on finances. And uh, Lord, we take something practical uh, away tonight. And would we also uh, have something shown about our heart uh, and money uh, that we need to see uh, tonight. And thank you for last week and Pray that you'd help him as he continues to teach this week and next week. Uh, Lord, I pray for these things that were uh, given to us tonight. Thank you for the work that you've already done in Sharon's uh, life. And it may just be that uh, for her to go in and out of the hospital like this has been a way to wake her up to the realization that uh, it's a point unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment that one day. Everybody will stand before you. And so I pray for conviction for her. And I pray that uh, the word of God would uh, strike at her heart and uh, show her her need uh, for you. Thank you for the Hallorans and um, their testimony to their friends. And thank you for Frankie and his being here tonight. Thank you for his burden for his family. And I pray for Dante uh, and Jamal uh, and Gadim. Uh, Lord, I, I pray for their spiritual condition. I pray that Frankie would be a good testimony to Gadim there in the house. And thank you for Francis and her faithfulness. And I pray uh, for all the brothers uh, to come to the realization that they desperately need you in one way or another. And, uh, Lord, there's this girl that's about uh, Bryn's age that uh, is facing a tumor. What an incredibly difficult thing to go through as a family. It's hard to even imagine uh, the situation uh, that they are placed into now, and we don't know anything about their spiritual condition, but Lord, I pray this be a time when they are looking for hope, uh, they're looking for peace, and they're looking in the right direction, and they go to your word. I'm sure that there's probably a Bible at home. I, I'm sure they've probably heard the gospel before, and I pray that all that would come back to their mind, uh, that they would go searching for you, uh, the good and loving uh, creator of them, and 
If they do know you, I pray that your grace would be sufficient. I pray, Lord, that they would find comfort, they'd find, uh, they'd find their trust in you. And I pray that you give peace in that situation. Thank you for Mr. Hammond is golfing uh, with this coworker, and I do pray that you would, would give him an opportunity. Would you just make it so obvious while they're out there on the golf course, uh, bring up uh, spiritual things, and that Mr. Hammond would give him, uh, have a chance to uh, give him the gospel. And uh, thank you for his uh, willingness to go with him and and be a testimony to him and a light to him. And pray for Josh and his mental. Um, health and the issues that are going on there. I pray that grace would be given in that situation and encouragement and wisdom. And I pray for Mr. Ham as he also talks to him. And uh, Lord, I pray for Adam's mom now having had the second hip surgery. I know that's got to be frustrating and obviously painful. And um, thank you that now the rehab can be done at home. And I do pray that this time our hip would be able to heal correctly. The rehab would not be so painful, uh, but that it will, she would gain a use of that hip quickly. Again, it all go the way that it's supposed to. And Lord, it seems like the summer has really flown by, and it's gone so fast, and now everybody's preparing to go back to school in, in some way or another. And I pray for those who are going to public schools. Uh, may they be prepared to be a light and a testimony and uh, salt that they would be able to uh, show others um, the love of Jesus Christ, and um, I pray for those who are homeschooling, those who are going to Christian school. I just pray that you would help in this time of getting ready and getting prepared, and and I pray that uh, the students would be uh, ready to to go back and just just do what you have called them to do and to serve you. And I pray for Emily's dad's leg, oh, Lord, and what a how close he came really to losing his leg in an uh, awful situation and. Thank you that the last that he told me is that it is getting better slowly, but I do pray that it would uh, heal quickly without any more uh, going back to where it was. I pray the medicine uh, would have an effect, and uh, thank you for his trust in you and uh, his arrest in you throughout this whole thing. And pray for the te teens and the kids outside today. Thank you for the program that is uh, for them uh, to enjoy and then to hear preaching for your word, from your word, and I especially pray for Lexi, and I pray that uh, she would have questions about the gospel, and I pray that uh, she would hear the good news that you love her, and, and if she's not saved, that she would eventually uh, come to know you. And uh, Lord, I pray for uh, Pastor Mike and his family. Thank you for the t chance they get to uh, get away and relax. As a family, I do pray that you would give them some refreshing time as a family so they're ready to go and serve you uh, when they get back. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right, let's see. Ryan, can I have you hand these out for me? This time I made more, so there should be plenty. All right, so last week, um, apparently having the, you know, pictures up there, in some cases were good, in some cases were distractions, so from what I heard. So, uh, no, just more, it's, I also didn't have time to put all sorts of pictures in it this time around, so. All right, so what we're going to go through, we are going to do a quick review of what we talked about last time, and then we're going to go into the, to the lesson for tonight. But just as an overall recap of what we dealt with last week, last week was the matter of the mind, or really the Bible talks about the mind or the heart being interchangeable. And the idea that really it starts with the way that we think where, where our heart is. And we talked about where, that our heart will follow our treasure. Where we put our treasure, our heart will follow. And it reveals what is in our heart, how we spend our money, how we, what we value, and how we spend our time as well. Now, we're not doing a whole series on time management. This is more just on finances, but they both really do go hand in hand. And to really see where you are, where your heart is, evaluate your time, evaluate how you spend your money, and then that'll be a good re reflection of really where your heart is. And as we do that, 
We need to remember Matthew 6, 33, but seek ye first the kingdom of God in his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And as I mentioned, your heart will follow your money. And we ask this question, what is it that you need to be content? What do you need to be content? And really from the Bible verses that we looked at before, there were basically two things that we needed, having food and raiment, clothing, therewith be content. And Paul had said that he had learned in whatsoever state he was, therewith to be content. In some situations, he had abounded. He, he, was, very, he was living very well. In other situations, and from the series that we just went through with Pastor, with, through the book of Acts, we see that he's in prison, or he might be in dungeon, or he might be getting beaten up. But even when he's getting beaten up and in jail, what does he do? He sings. And then he's delivered and is able to win the, the jailer over. And actually now we're talking about the book of Philippians, which goes along with that as well. So as we look at this, it's no matter what condition, no matter what state we're in, whether it's God's blessing us tremendously, and that's okay, we're content with that. We don't have a sense of guilt to how God has blessed us, but then we don't also become, get a sense of pride over how God has blessed us either and think too highly of ourselves. So God has given us the different things to enjoy, and like he, he blessed Abraham tremendously. And we look at Job and all the different things that he had to suffer. And remember, the key is not how much money you have. The key is your heart towards the money. It's the love of money that's the issue. And when everything was stripped away from Job, what did he say? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. My heart, my trust is in the Lord, not in the stuff that I have. And so that's the idea of we can need to start getting our minds in that direction. And we need to keep in mind that the words that we use matter. And this isn't only for ourselves, but this is in the words that we choose to use around our kids, around our family members. And, you know, you, what is it that they hear from you a lot? Or is it that they're always hearing how worried you are about things? Or are they hearing how you are trusting in God, even when there aren't a lot of things? Are they hearing about how, oh, we just, if we only had this, if we only had that? Are you hearing it from yourself? And the words do matter. Need versus want. You know, the idea of, you know, sometimes a, a kid will come up to you and say, but I just, I, I need this. I, I just gotta have it. And we're all, you know, we're, we're, we're too good for that. Of course, we don't necessarily say it that way, but we just sometimes think it too. Oh, if I just had this, I just need that. Do you really? Or do you really want it? Well, I need it. Need it in order to be happy? Well, you know, what, why do you need it? If you need it in order to survive or in order to be happy or in order to serve the Lord or in order to what? What do you mean by you need? So being very careful with the I need this to I, I want this, it would be good but being careful with that. Another thing is I have to versus I choose to. You know, oh, I have to go to work today. No, you don't. No, you don't. You can choose not to go to work today. Now, you might not like the consequence. You don't always get to choose the consequence that comes from your choice, but it's still a choice. And so sometimes we have this victim mentality of I have to do this, that, or the other. No, you choose to do this, that, or the other, and therefore you are in control. And with God's help, God's wisdom, you make the choice according to his word, but it is still a choice. And so we, we're careful with those. I have to. No, you don't. You can choose not to do your chores. You can choose not to make your bed. You can choose not to do different things. But again, you can make that choice, but you don't always get to choose the consequence that comes with it. And that's something that we can help teach our kids as well. And then the, the idea between investing and spending. How are you investing your time as opposed to spending your time? How are you investing your money as opposed to spending your money? And it's an investment. And again, not every expense, like a pastor came up to me uh, the other day. He's, he's going on a vacation. Is that an investment or an expenditure? 
Well, it could very well be an investment. It's an investment in his health. It's an investment in his family and the relationships that could be there. So it's not like every, you can't, you know, spend anything on something that gives you fun or gives you pleasure. That's not the idea. But overall, what are you doing it for? Is it just all about me and how I want to do, it's for me, 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 me. Or do I have a perspective of serving God and serving others? So there's just different ways of thinking, choosing the words that we use with ourselves, choosing the words that we use with our kids. And as we make those conscious choices in what we say, it helps us to really think about it. And just a challenge as you go throughout the next couple of weeks, just listen to yourself, listen to those around you, see how many times they say, I have to do something. See how many times they say, I need this, or even, and this one doesn't come up as much, but the idea of, oh, I'm spending this or I'm spending that. So just, just listen to yourself, listen to others, and start to change the way that you think and the way that you speak so that you can then influence others as well. So last time we had two bigger passages that we went through. This week it's going to be a little different in that we're going to be hopping around through a lot of different verses, uh, mostly in Proverbs. So if you want to be, have your Bibles there, but we will also have the verses on the screen just for sake of time so you can follow along there. The passages are on the handouts if you want to go back and look them up later. Uh, I think after I printed the handout, I might have added one or two more little things, so you can always double check as you're going through. All right, first one. Know your financial state. Know your financial state. One of your homework assignments from last time was to start writing down your expenditures because part of the goal is for you to really understand if you're in control or not if you're spending or you're investing in your life and in the lives of others you need to know where it's going and so that means that you need to keep track of it and so know your financial state proverbs 27 23 be thou diligent to know the state of thy flocks and look well to thy herds well, you probably aren't going to go home and start counting your sheep unless you're trying to go to sleep. Um, but we don't have the same type of economy that they did back then. But the principle still remains, and that is that we are to be a good steward of what God has given to us. And therefore, we need to look diligently to know the state of our flock. And by the way, again, as parents, it's not just God... In that, or having given us money to steward, but it's also the lives of our kids. And so when we talk about knowing the state of our flock, it's not just a state of our economy, but also the state of our kids. How are they doing? What's going through their minds? What are their worries? What are their concerns? How are they growing spiritually? Are we investing in that? Do we know the state of our flock? So we need to be diligent. And that's the idea. Diligent means that it takes effort. It's not just something that will happen by accident. Chaos is what tends to happen when you don't take care of it, when you aren't diligent. And that can be, again, with your finances or with your children as well. So be diligent. Have a plan. If you don't have a plan for your money, others will. If you don't have a plan for your money, others will. That, I mean, you listen to any commercial. They have plenty of plans for your money. Give it to me. Buy this. Buy that. There's a lot of get-rich-quick schemes. There's a lot of other schemes out there, some that are legit. But if you're not, you know, if you don't really have a plan for it, others will. Proverbs 13, 16. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth upon his folly. Prudent man, someone who is wise, is going to deal with knowledge. That means that they're going to inform themselves. They're going to take and study to understand the basics of what is needed and then go beyond. We live in a very technological world. We live in a very uh, just information age. There's so much information, sometimes it's too much information. But so we can go to a couple of extremes. You know, we study everything out to the minutia. And then we get nothing done because there's so much information. Or we just like, nope, too much information, so I just put my head in the sand and don't do anything. No, we can't 
fall into either one of those two extremes, but we do have to be prudent, we have to be wise, we have to get the knowledge necessary around some of the different things. Sometimes we're intimidated by, okay, what does it take to get a will? I don't know, too much effort, so I'll just push it off. What does it take to, you know, have a, an IRA? Well, I, I don't even know what those letters are, so I, I don't know. You know, it, so there's different terms, there's different things, and just, it takes time. Yes, you don't have to do it all at once, but you, we should be getting some knowledge as we go through. Every prudent man dealeth with knowledge, but a fool layeth upon his folly. He just lays around like, uh, yeah, no, can't do it. Luke 14, 28 through 30. For which of you, intending to build a tower, sitteth not down first and counteth the cost, whether he has sufficient to finish it? Lest haply, after he hath laid the foundation, it is not able to finish all the, finish it, all that behold it begin to mock him, saying, this man began to build and was not able to finish. Uh, my wife is not, I, I never considered her really a business person. It was just not really something that she was into. However, um, she has started getting into uh, the idea, she, she makes soap, and she wants to do that now as not just a hobby, but being able to take that and at least not lose money on it. Um, and be able to at least sell. And it's been interesting to watch her to actually, she ordered this, this course where she, it's business for soap making and just going through the different chapters and reading it and applying the different principles. And she's getting into it and things that it's not just the soap making, but all the other stuff that has to go into it in the business realm of it. And there's a lot of information out there. And she's being diligent. She's studying it. She's counting the cost, seeing, okay, how much does it cost me for the materials? How much does it take for this? How much does it take for that? And so if I do that, what am I going to have to sell this for in order to recoup the money that I've done? How many bars of soap do I have to create in this period of time? Blah, blah, blah. And she's counting the cost to see how it's all going to come out. We, in one of the cases, she was about to make a batch and she didn't quite have enough of the ingredients. So she had to wait. She put it on order, and then it took them longer to, for it to come that they had promised, but it finally did get there. If she had started to make that batch before she had all the ingredients, it would have been ruined. You have to count the cost. You need to really see what all's involved before you start. Maybe you've done that with a recipe. Uh, I think I've done it once. Fortunately, we were just able to run down to our local Dollar General which is all over the place around here, um, and just pick up the missing ingredients that we needed so I was able to finish it. Um, yeah, the thing was making chocolate chip cookies and I was missing the eggs. Um, doesn't come out too well without them. So the, it's one of those things where you count the cost. Now that's simple illustration, but seriously, in our life, are we counting to see where we are or are we just going and spending? And to now, nowadays, we have this luxury of, you know, this little rectangular thing that magically allows you to buy all sorts of things. It's, it's wonderful <laughs> until you get the bill. And if you don't really understand what's going on with that, you wind up paying instead of that one item that you bought on credit for $100, you wind up spending three times that for that thing by the time it's all said and done. And by the way, that is something that here in the States, we've had credit cards for a lot longer. So it's still a bad problem for a lot of people, but at least a lot of people still understand some of the dangers of it. And the government keeps the interest rates from being too crazy on those. In Peru, it's a newer thing, and a lot of pastors didn't really understand what they were getting themselves into, and they got it, and they went out, and they would buy some stuff, and then they're like, oh, yeah, you only have to pay this minimum amount, you know. And, and then, oops, I paid it, but I paid it a little bit late. And some of their late fees is like 100%. Um, and so it was great. And the regular interest is around 25%. Um, and it's like you don't understand. And it's dangerous. It's dangerous here, too. But I have seen it cripple pastors especially in Peru, um, because they don't have the knowledge 
they haven't under, studied it, they haven't counted the cost, it sounded good, and they went for it. So we need to count the cost. We need to be diligent. In James 4, 13 to 15, Ye that say, Today or tomorrow we will go into such a city and continue there a year and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas ye know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. For that ye ought to say, If the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. Now, some people use the beginning part of this verse to contradict what I'm saying. Because I'm saying we need to have a plan. And this is saying, hey, you don't need a plan. Because here it's saying the person who thought that he has a plan, I'm going to go do this, I'm going to go do that, I'm going to make money. And the Bible says, but hey, what is life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. So don't worry, just go eat, drink, be happy, for tomorrow you shall die. No, that's another passage, but you can't just take bits and pieces like that. Verse 15, for that ye ought to say, if the Lord will, we shall live and do this or that. So there is still the planning, but it's with the acknowledgement that the plans are based on what the Lord wants and what the Lord will allow, not just my own plans. But it is still planning. It's not just the absence of it. And Proverbs 16, 9 goes right along with that. A man's heart deviseth his way, but the Lord directeth his steps. We are to make the plans, but then we are to yield those plans to the direction of the Lord as he guides us. Um, when I was a kid, there were times when, before I learned how to drive and even had a permit or whatever, um, I would get into the car and I would, I would steer. I would even pull up on the emergency brake, and for me, the emergency brake was like a little missile launcher. So you'd push the little button and go down one, you launch one missile, you push and go down another and launch another missile and go down. Of course, the car's not moving, okay? It's turned off, there's nobody in it, the ignition, you know, nothing. So, and we were flat, so the emergency brake wasn't like gonna send me down a hill, fortunately. So, but I, I could do that, but you know what? No matter how much steering is going on, I'm going nowhere. The only way that the steering works is if the car is in motion. You know, sometimes we're like, okay, God, Lead me. I'm going to sit here in this chair, wait for you to lead me. Um, you know, big sign in the sky would be good. Airplane maybe with, you know, how they have the banners on the back, something like that to tell me what to do. And then I'll know where to go. Or I'll even accept, you know, a cloud in the form of an arrow pointing me in a direction, you know, whatever. But I'm going to sit here until I get that call. No. While being in the way, the Lord led me. Take that step but each step that you take, ask God, God, what is the very next step that you want me to take? Okay, now what? And he doesn't show us 10 years down the road. We went to Peru anticipating that we would have stayed there pretty much the rest of our lives. That was only five years before the Lord redirected us. Our plans, we had plans, but he redirects. And we have to be okay with that as well. But we still plan. So once we start making our plans, in our plans, one of the first things that we need to do is we need to be, great, be a grateful giver to God. The Lord enjoys a happy giver, a joyful giver. In Proverbs 3, 9 and 10, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. So shall thy barns be filled with plenty, and thy presses shall burst out with new wine. In other places, it talk, the Bible talks about where the nation of Israel had been, had been stealing from him and that they had not been giving him the tithes and offerings. How are we doing with that? Well, you see, it's really tight. I just can't. I, who are you trusting for your happiness, for your provision, for what you really need? Are you trusting in what you can do, or are you trusting in God? If you give to him, he has promised that he will never leave us, he will never forsake us, that he will provide for us. Now, it doesn't mean he will always give us everything that we want. It doesn't mean that we won't go through hard times. We will. In fact, he promises that we will go through hard times. You know, I think we, we have such a such an easy mentality. You know, it's like, oh, I'm, I'm being persecuted for my faith. I mean, this person laughed at me. I'm sorry, that's not persecution. 
you know, we, we got to get out of that. In fact, you know, when we look at our economy and the economy maybe starts tanking or whatever, why would we expect it not to? I mean, if you look at how the Bible goes, what does it tell us before the Lord comes, what's going to happen? There's going to be wars and rumors of wars. There's going to be pestilence. There's going to be, it's, it's pretty dire. So do we want the Lord to come back? When do we want him to come back? Sooner? That means what comes right before that. So does that mean we want that too? You can't have it both ways. So I was on an airplane once and one of the, I was witnessing to one guy and he's like, oh, this, the world just keeps getting worse and worse. I'm like, yeah, exactly. The Bible says that it will. It does? Yeah, it does. And give you a chance to talk about that as well. But we should not be surprised when that happens. Now, could, can the Lord bring revival? Absolutely. But it starts with us, and it starts to make sure that our heart is where it needs to be. But if things wax worse and worse, it's okay. God gives. God takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's the heart. The, the, he gives. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's easy. He t- 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 takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And again, easy to say until perhaps it's yanked away, and that's when the true test comes. Avoid being a slave to debt. Avoid being a slave to debt, and that's really what it is. You know, we talk about in America, we have our freedom. I'm a slave, and I'm not a slave to anyone. We don't believe in slavery. We should abolish slavery. And I agree. And yet, how willingly do we then put ourselves into slavery? Proverbs 22, 7, The rich ruleth over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. If you borrowed money, you owe somebody, you owe them. You owe your effort, your time, your money, until it's all paid off. Don't get yourself into that situation. Be very careful. Avoid debt as the plague. Yes, it's so easy. It's so convenient. But be very careful with that. And if you are in debt, what do you do about it? Have gazelle-like focus. And that's a phrase from Dave Ramsey. Um, And he said when he was coming out because he... He was doing very well in real estate, and then he got ahead of himself, got into a lot of debt, went bankrupt, um, and so he, he was like trying to figure out his life, and that's when he got back into the Bible, came across this passage in Proverbs 6, verses 1 to 5. My son, if thou be surety for thy friend, if thou hast stricken thy hand with a stranger, thou art snared with the words of thy mouth, art taken with the words of thy, of thy mouth, do this now, my son, and deliver thyself when thou art come into the hand of thy friend, Go, humble thyself, and make sure thy friend. Give not sleep to thine eyes, nor slumber to thine eyelids. Deliver thyself as a roe for the hand of the hunter and as a bird from the hand of the fowler. The roe, deer, gazelle, all related. So the idea here is that whenever you have the, uh, a, a, an animal that's about to attack the deer, what does it do? It takes off and it has an intense focus on escaping. And that's all it cares about doing is getting away. And many times they succeed. Why? Because the prey, or the, the, the hunter, is out trying to get it, and eventually just gets, uh, okay, forget it. <laughs> I'm too tired to keep chasing it, and gives up. But there's an intensity to it. And actually, Debbie was talking about, uh, she was teaching a lesson on certain kinds of rabbits as well. Uh, same, same idea. It's actually the smaller rabbits can do better because they're zigging and zagging and staying just very intense on finding that spot to hide and being able to just move away. And there is a focus and intensity of it. And that's what it needs to be. If you're in debt, there needs to be some focus to it, not just, eh, whatever, whenever. Everybody's in debt. Everybody does it. You know, it's just the way life is nowadays. Is it? Well, it might be the way that most people do it that doesn't make it right. So have some focus, have some intensity, but don't try to do it alone. You know, a lot of times we become lone wolves, 
and it's the American independence, and I'm not going to ask for help from anybody. Don't try to do it alone. Without counsel, purposes are disappointed, but in the multitude of counselors, they are established. Proverbs 15, 22. You know, there are people that know more about retirement stuff. Don't be afraid to ask them. There are more people that know about taxes. That's part of finances, unfortunately. Ask them. They're not how to avoid taxes, okay? We're not talking about doing that. Render unto Caesar that which is Caesar's. It is biblical to pay our taxes, okay? So we can't just say, well, I, I have got to obey God rather than man. So I'm going to use my money the way I want to. No, the, use the money according to how God wants you. And part of that is be generous to God. <sighs> Pay your government. Might not have to be generous with the government, but pay what you need to give to the government and then be generous with others as well as you go forward from there. But don't, just be aware of that. Get counsel, get an understanding in that. Do what is legal. There are legal things that you can do to minimize your, your burden, your tax burden. That's fine. But do everything that is legal in that realm. But get counsel. Nothing wrong with that. Proverbs 28, 26, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whosoever walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. Don't trust yourself. You know, your thoughts, your heart is desperately evil. If you just, if, if all you're doing is going by what you want, and again, it goes back to the needs and wants, you might think it's really a need and we have to have it now. And especially when you have a salesman that's coming up and is trying to sell you something and you're like, oh, I have to, ooh, yeah, that sounds really good. I'm going to do that. And they're like, and of course, this deal only lasts 30 minutes. That's a usually a red flag to say, okay, good to know. Thanks, no thanks. And walk away. Take the time to ask somebody else. And one of the first people that you should be asking is your spouse. Work with your spouse, not against your spouse, with your spouse. Do you trust your spouse when it comes to money? One of the biggest reasons for divorce is money. And part of that is because sometimes the couples don't even talk about it. They just, one, completely trust the other, or and the other sometimes in, they say that one's usually a spender and one's usually the, the saver, but sometimes they're not talking. They don't have common goals of what they're even necessarily saving money for. So the one even who's the saver might get to the point he saved or she has saved for a specific thing, but that's not really where the other one thinks that it should go. And so then there's conflicts. There's some that to avoid that conflict they have prenuptial agreements, and they keep their money completely separate from each other. But if the two are supposed to be one, you should be working together. And even if it's not an issue of, well, yes, I trust my spouse completely. That's why I let them handle everything about the finances. That's dangerous too, because sometimes what you're doing is you're un unknowingly perhaps putting a lot of extra burden on them to know and handle everything, and then they want to hide it from you, perhaps, that maybe you're not doing as well as you think. And there's that extra pressure. And there are people, families that have gone bankrupt, and the spouse didn't even know that they were about to go bankrupt. Then there's other spouses. The one dies, and the other one has never handled anything with the money, doesn't have a clue. And it's very hard for them at that point to pick up and figure out what's going on. So work together, work with your spouse. Amos 3.3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Now, that's not saying that you have to alternate this month you balance the checkbook, next month I balance the checkbook. Okay, no, but at least sit down and talk about it. Agree on it, agree where you're spending the money, where you should be spending the money, and then follow that plan that goes with the have a plan and then work the plan. And if you don't know the plan, you can't work it. So come to an agreement, walk together, 
by being agreed with what you're trying to accomplish. Proverbs 31, 10 through 12. Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil. She will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. Do you trust her? You know, the Bible talks about, in this case, she's somebody who's very worthy of trust. Women sometimes do better than the men as far as keeping tabs on some, some things. Not all. Some men do better than others. It's okay. God has made us and gifted us with different abilities, and it's okay for one of the two to be the primary money handler. But the other one still needs to be informed and know what is going on. Be careful. Trust each other. Now, what's the phrase? Trust but verify? Um, you know, yeah, trust, but then in, as a teacher, the phrase was inspect what you expect. If you're expecting a certain thing, just check on it from time to time to see if it's really the case. Inspect what you expect. By the way, that's true with our kids as well. Very much so. Uh, the other thing about this, and this is sort of a, a freebie right now, but it, it, as we're talking these principles, it is something that a lot of times we don't teach our kids these principles either. And the only way that a, a child really knows how to learn how to handle money is if they have some money to handle. Now, make them work for it. That's fine. But then give them an allowance or whatever. But then whenever they're asking for something, then you can say, well, do you have the money for it? Uh... Okay, so how much does it cost? All right, so you need to start saving for it. Here's some things that you can do towards that. And then they might get that money and realize, you know what, I don't really want to buy that anymore because now it costs them something. All right, so just teach them, and that goes in with the saving. Teach them how to save. Learn how to save ourselves as well. Proverbs 6, verses 6 through 8 Go to the ant, thou sluggard, consider her ways and be wise, which having no guide, overseer, or ruler, provideth her meat in the summer and gathereth her food in the harvest. Works diligently, gathers, stores it up, and then has to live off of whenever there isn't any more for a while. And the ant, they're really annoying. All right, we've got a lot of them in our backyard. Fortunately, they stay mostly out there. Um, but there's just... They're annoying sometimes, but the Bible uses them as a good example of what we're supposed to be doing as well. We're diligent. We need to be diligent like they are. It's interesting. They, they have their mounds, and sometimes when they get too close to the house, then more drastic steps are taken. But other times, like if I'm just mowing, uh, sometimes I'll run over one of them, one of the little mounds. I know. I'm sorry. Um, and it's amazing all the activity all of a sudden that happens there. They all come out. Come back the next day, it's all put back together. They're diligent in what they do. Now, I'm not saying we have to stay up all night and you know, be an ant in that regard. But the idea is God uses it as an example that we are supposed to be diligent and take what we have, save it for when there is an emergency. Save it for when we have, and sometimes it's not even an emergency. We know that down the road certain things are going to happen. How many of you have a car that is that is as old as you. Okay. So cars have a tendency to break down, be stolen too soon. Um, you know, whatever. They, 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 they go away. You know, they break down, whatever. And we know that that's going to happen. Your washer, your dryer, your refrigerator, any appliance, all of those things in due time will break down. Is it an emergency when that happens? Shouldn't be. Ideally, you know that's going to happen. You need to be saving for something like that. Um, by the way, this applies to churches as well. Um, I think there's a lot of churches who don't even have a working budget. It's pretty much everything is an emergency. Okay, we want to do this, and so we're just going to, you know, we have to buy this. Like, especially... If you have a church that has three, four different people on staff and you know they have an office, they have computers that they're going to be using, it should, granted I work with tech, 
And computers can last a little longer than they used to, but at some point, that computer is going to need to be replaced. Whether that's three years, which is what a lot of businesses do it, every three years they're replacing theirs. That might be a little too aggressive. Five, you might even get seven. But anything beyond that, it's probably okay. You know, you probably should have the money set aside or being built up so that when the time comes, we know it's coming, we make the purchase. And the same goes with our life, the same goes with the church, being wise, saving for those times and those events, that you, things that you are important for you to be able to minister in the sense of the church or for you to live if it's for yourself. But we need to save. Proverbs 21, 20, there is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. I have it, I spend it. Comes in, it goes out. In fact, with the credit card, it goes out before it even comes in. And then I will spend it all, and I'll get it all loaded up on the credit card, and then I will pay off at least part of it at the end of the month, and hopefully I'll have enough. Save and then spend, not spend and then try to get the money for it. And then leave a legacy. In other words, it's not just a matter of saving for ourselves, but it's also the opportunity to leave for others. Proverbs 13, 22, A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children, and the wealth of the sinner is laid up for the just. A good man leaveth an inheritance to his children's children. In other words, his grandkids. By the way, leaving an inheritance is not just about money. Okay? Again, for some, you might have more money that you're going to be leaving to your kids and grandkids than others. What's more important than the money that you leave behind is the heritage that you leave behind, an inheritance of godliness and of a good testimony of serving God and serving others. They can learn from that example much more than just the finances that you might leave them. But if the Lord blesses you and work, you work through it, you have the money to provide a legacy to help them as they can as well, and that's fine too. But remember, more important than just the money that you can leave behind is the godly example that you leave behind as well. The turtle, the tortoise always wins. The good old story, you know, they have the rabbit and the tortoise, the turtle. The turtle, because he's slow and steady, he wins the race. Whereas the rabbit gets distracted. He might take off like a bullet, but he gets distracted and fades away. Proverbs 21, 5, the thoughts of the diligent tend only to plenteousness, but of every one that is hasty, only to want. The get-rich-quick schemes, the I got to get the lottery, I got to do this, I got to do that in order to do it. No, be diligent, be consistent, take small steps, but work through it. And if you're consistent with it, the Lord will provide, and will you, that little bit can grow. It's the idea of interest, compounding interest. You can have it work against you in the sense of credit cards, or you can have it work for you in the sense of savings. And that's where the money tends to really start growing, is as you invest, you invest early, you invest steadily, and as you do that, that will grow. And it's amazing how quickly it can grow if you are consistent. And if you start early, that definitely helps as well. So. At the point in your life when you can least afford it is the point in your life where you should mostly do it. Keep that in mind as well. And this is easier for me to say. It was a lot harder for me to do. And I did, was not very good at that early on myself. Uh, when I was a Christian school teacher, we, were, we taught one year down in Miami. Uh, both my wife and I were working full-time at the Christian school. Second year, our son came, so she went to part-time. Then we moved to Maryland, and she was staying at home. So it's one salary on a Christian school salary, um, very tight. Uh, and then, but the Lord always provided. Okay? The Lord always provided. And just look for the opportunity, look for ways that you can. But ultimately, again, it's not just about the money. Um, I could have gone into technology a lot sooner. But the Lord was giving me the opportunity to minister to people in that time period, and that was a huge investment as well. 
and the Lord always did provide, and that's okay. But if you have the opportunity, be diligent. Early on is very helpful. But through all of that, integrity matters. Integrity matters. Proverbs 13, 11, Wealth gotten by vanity shall be diminished, but he that gathereth by labor shall increase. Proverbs 22, 16, He that oppresseth the poor to increase his riches, and he that giveth to the rich shall surely come to want. He that giveth to the rich, the idea there of bribery, trying to get them to be able to do favors for you. But he that oppresses the poor, that's, that's how you're trying to get rich? No. If you're trying to do it by bribing or trying to get, get, gain favor from the rich, they don't need you. They don't care about you. It's not going to help. Jeremiah 17, 11, As the partridge sitteth on eggs and hatch them not, so he that getteth riches and not by right shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at his end shall be a fool. Ultimately, there is a day of reckoning that is coming that is beyond any wealth and riches that we have on this earth. And we need to live with that eternal point of view instead of just the temporal. He that is faithful in that which is least is faithful also in much, and he that is unjust in the least is unjust also in much. Are you being faithful with what God has already given you before you're asking him to give you more? God, I just, if, if I just had this much more, yeah, if you had that much more, you would continue to spend it all on this instead of what I've called you to do. Or, no, I see that you are being faithful with what you have. I'm going to trust you with more. Be faithful with what you do have. And again, that's money. It's also your time, and it's your family. Be faithful with what you do have. Now, let me go through some practical things um, that Dave Ramsey, his, he calls him his seven baby, baby steps. If you're not familiar with Dave Ramsey, you can look up his organization online. He is a Christian. Uh, I'm sure his doctrine he's, might not be 100% in line with everything that we do. He's probably, I don't know. I haven't read through his complete doctrinal statement because his business is, um, it's really, he, he doesn't make any hesitation of saying he's a Christian. He puts it out there, but there's also going to be aspects of that that it's just not going to be exactly the type of church perhaps that we would be comfortable with. But the principles are still good. So, seven baby steps. What are they? First off, save $1,000 for a starter emergency fund. That is, if you, don't, if, if you have debt or other things, and just to get you going, put aside $1,000 as an emergency fund for something that might come up that you don't know about. That's why it's an emergency fund. Now, an emergency fund is not for going out to eat. It's not for, uh, I, this is an emergency. I, I just have to be able to go play with my buddies, a round of golf or whatever it might be. You don't understand. The Super Bowl's coming on. It's an emergency. Our TV just broke down. We got to get this big play, you know, Big screen, whatever it might be. Now they, they keep getting bigger. I, my arm's probably not even big enough. But, you know, that's not an emergency. But get $1,000 for your starter emergency fund. Then work on paying off any debt that you currently do have. And what he calls using the, uh, the snowball effect, that is you write out all your debts, all your credit cards. By the way, if you're going to do this, and it's credit card debt, cut up the credit card. Don't keep using it, okay? So... But write down all of your, your, all the things that you owe. Start with the one that you owe the least on all the way to what you owe the most on. Pay off the one that you owe the least on. That way it's done. And then it, it creates a snowball because then what happens is the money that you were paying to that one, you pay the minimum on everything else and pay as much as you can towards this one. Then when that one's paid off, you take all the money that you're paying to that one and you apply it to the next one. And you keep working your way down. And as you do that, it snowballs. It gets gathering a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more that you keep applying to the next debt. And then that debt starts going down that much faster to the point where you no longer are in debt. But you pay that off as quickly as possible with the gazelle mentality. And the idea is, you know, sometimes it might hurt. And the only way really to get out of debt is... Reduce your expenditure 
and or increase your income. It's really what it boils down to. You either have to make, get more money or you have to reduce how much you're spending. And then by doing that, you have more to put towards your debt. So it's not always fun, but it is important to go through your list of things that you consider to be needs and say, you know what? That's not really a need, that's a want. We can do without that, at least for a time period. We can do without that, and we can dedicate that money to this item. Now, next week, we're going to be looking at more specific, like I'm going to bring a couple of case studies, and we're not your money, so then you can be more critical about how other people are doing it, and we're going to say, okay, given this case study, what would you suggest? What do we need to do to get them into a healthy condition? Save then, after you've paid off all your debt, then increase your emergency fund so that it's three to six months worth of expenditures. Why? Because people do lose their job. Now, I was fortunate enough during the pandemic that our company actually did, did well. So I wasn't in trouble, but I knew a lot of other people that were. And a lot of people did lose their job. And so that might happen. So have, have three to six months worth of expenditure saved up. That way, if for some reason you do have to go look for another job, while you're looking for another job, you're okay. And your family's okay. And you're not having to fall back into debt to cover that. Then, in, after you've done that, you're out of debt, you have your three to six month in, emergency fund built up, take and invest 15% of your household income in retirement. So after, so everything that comes in off the top, be generous to God, save by investing, live off the rest. And if that means that you, but I, I'm out of debt now, so I can start buying all these things. No, you're going to go right back into debt. No, I, if, you, if you're not careful, you will. So have the savings and make it just off the top. You don't even see it. Um, it's, you know, it comes out, of, in my case, it comes out of my paycheck before I even get the money, so I don't have to, you know, be, a, be tempted with it or whatever. It's just, it's gone. So if you can do that, that's great. If you have to write the check or you have to put it into a different account, do whatever it takes, but try to get to the point where you're investing 15% of your household income in retirement. Save for your children's college fund if you are at that point. My kids are winding that down, hopefully. Um, but others of you might not be there yet, so then start saving for that as well. And pay off your home. Buy and pay off your home early if you can as well. Um, we are we're trying to get ours paid off. We're not there yet, um, but we're working towards that as well, trying to get that done, uh, hopefully in the next seven years. We'll see. Um, but the idea is if you can get rid of that, because that's, for most of us, that's our biggest expense of the month. Um, and if we can get that one out of the way, then we don't have to worry about, okay, all of a sudden something does come up. Well, I don't have a rent. I don't have a mortgage anymore. It's okay. It gives us more wiggle room. So be diligent in that regard as well. And then from there, continue to build wealth, not just for yourself, but to invest Invest in, yes, for future income for yourself, but also so that you can be generous investing in lives of others. Because ultimately, when we die, that money is there. It's done. You're not taking it with you. The only thing that you take with you are the souls of people. And that is where we should be investing our time and money. On the flip side of the sheets that you have, we're not going to go through this, but this is more for you to just take home and think through as you're doing your homework. So on your homework assignment, it was to be writing down your expenditures. One of the things that sometimes we overlook because you're doing it over this narrower period of time might be expenditures that don't come up during this narrow window of time, such as, what's your plans for Christmas? Are you budgeting for that? Are you setting aside money so that when Christmas comes, it's not like, oh, we need to buy all these gifts and where are we gonna get the money for it? Uh, credit card, no. So. If your plan is, okay, talk it over, figure out, okay, we're, we're going to roughly spend this amount for Christmas. We divide that out 12 months in a year. That means each month we need to be setting aside this much for Christmas. It's a practical thing. Same thing for birthday gifts or other gifts or other things like that. 
And then we talked about appliances breaking down or other things breaking down. Are you setting aside, aside some money for that? Are you setting aside some money for clothes? They do wear out. You know, we're, we're not going through on our way to the promised land that for 40 years, our shoes don't go bad and the clothes that we wear don't go bad. I have never had a pair of shoes last me 40 years. Granted, I'm only 49, so. Um, but I haven't had a pair of uh, tennis shoes, usually two years tops. And, they're, you know, so I got a budget for that somehow. And I'm not the only one that's going to need clothes or shoes, you know. So budget for it. Be thinking about it. Now, with your kids, part of that is teaching them to use some of their money for things, especially if it's not a real need, it's a want, even in clothes, because some clothes we know it's style or it's this or it's that. This is what you need, but it might not be the latest fashion. It might not be the whatever. That's fine. You want this one, you pay the difference, okay? And teach them how to manage that as well. But there's some different ideas of just try to think through it. And as you're starting to come up with a plan of just be knowledgeable about where the money is going, that will help you to be able to get your footing on track for moving forward. So next week, what we'll be doing, like I said, we'll be taking some case studies. We'll be looking at some other principles, but we want it to be very hands-on and very practical and see how we can just start putting some of these principles into practice. All right? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the principles that you have given us in there. And even though your, your, Bible, your Bible, your word, is not just uh, a self-help guide, it's not just an economy book, or, but Lord, the principles you have, you have in there are solid, and they can help us, but help us to remember that our goal is not just to get rich. Our goal is not to find our hope and our salvation and money, but our goal is to find our hope our trust, our salvation in you. And then to use the money as a tool to minister and to bless others. And so I pray that you would give us that heart, that you would then fill our minds with the correct knowledge that we can then start to apply as we go from here. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, thank you. Have a great week.